Uh, I'm Elsa Reichbanis in the School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering here at Tech, and I've got courtesy appointments in Chemistry and Material Science, and I'm a member of Coke. Um, I'm going to ask uh, the speakers for uh, this next session to please be cognizant of time. Uh, there are half hour time slots, but I will be cutting you off after 25 minutes. Uh, so that we do have a, at least a little bit of time uh, for questions and discussion. Uh, and be forewarned that I will cut you off if you go long. Uh, with that said, uh, the first talk is going to be by Professor Seth Martyr uh, in the School of Chemistry, and he's talking about the organic chemistry of surfaces. Seth? Okay, thank you, Elsa. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to talk to Lou about the organic chemistry of surfaces, and um, my talk is going to be one that is uh, representative of the work of several groups. Um, so uh, this represents a collaborative effort amongst uh, the Breda group, who is predominantly doing computational chemistry, Baratunda's Kohler group, who's interested in thermal management issues, uh, Jennifer Curtis, who uh, is interested in some nanolithography work. Sam Graham, who's interested in some work on graphene and thermal management and processing. Cliff Henderson, who's been doing some work on graphene-related things. Bernard Kiplin's group, who's been involved in a bunch of different things. Myself, we make stuff. Joe Perry's group, um, uh, who's been doing some work that I'm not going to discuss today on capacitors. And Elisa Rieto's group, uh, who's been doing work on AFM. And so we'll touch on um, surface modification. We've been using surface modification to compatibilize nanoparticles with uh, ferroelectric polymers and other types of polymers for capacitors. We've also been doing surface modification on flat surfaces to uh, affect the reactivity of surfaces as well as the surface energy as well as the work function. And um, last year there was a paper that appeared in Science um, on the use of um, aliphatic amine polymers for affecting the, the work function of surfaces. And so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, these various um, projects. Okay, So you saw some work on the use of uh, silanes for surface modification. Um, over the last six or seven years, we've been playing around a fair amount with phosphonic acids. Uh, we think that for certain types of applications, they have um, attractive properties relative to silanes. Um, they tend to um, bind very, very strongly to metal oxides. Indeed, the only oxide that we've had some difficulty uh, binding these uh, phosphonic acids to is silica, although we've, we've made some progress on that, and others have as well. They don't self-condense nearly as easily as silanes, and so you can work with them in air more easily without them oligomerizing. Um, they, they can be stored for long periods of time without oligomerizing. And, um, and they are less likely to form multi-layers. Okay? For some applications, you may want to form multi-layers, and for others, you may want to avoid doing that. They're often crystalline solids, and um, you can do surface modification actually in the presence of water. They're also quite easy to make. Okay, so uh, you've seen these kinds of pictures before earlier today, and it just points out the fact that in uh, some optoelectronic devices, you either have to worry about injecting charges or collecting charges. And in order to do that, you may want the Fermi level of your electrodes to be aligned with the relevant. Um, ionization potentials of your donor or acceptor layers. And phosphonic acids provide a, a very simple way to tune that work function over a relatively broad range. So this is work that's um, been out for a while, but it just shows here that we can modify things and tune the work function over um, a range of over a volt pretty easily with uh, these simple phosphonic acids. Um, you can understand what's going on, and uh, I know Bernard is fond of talking about um, Cope being in Pasteur's quadrant. Um, 
And what that means is that we actually really want to have a fundamental understanding of what we're doing. We're not Edisonian by nature. And so we use a combination of um, synthesis theory, um, characterization at a variety of different levels, both using capabilities available to us at Georgia Tech and through our collaborators throughout the world uh, to study this. So in this particular case, we've done a fair amount of work um, working with Jean-Luc Bredas' group as well as groups at the University of Arizona and the University of Washington to understand the binding and the orientation of phosphonic acids with respect to surfaces. And I'll just point out that uh, you know, Jean-Luc's group has done a fair amount to model the interactions of phosphonic acids with surfaces, in this case ITO, to understand um, the, the thermodynamic preference for binding with one, two, or three oxygens, um, what happens in terms of the amount of charge transfer that you have between the phosphonic acid and the surface as a function of actually creating these bonds. Okay, What are the preferred angles between the molecular dipoles of the phosphonic acid in the surface. And then that has been looked at in combination with uh, techniques including uh, NEXAFs and IRAS to get experimental measures of this so that we can test, um, one, we can test the accuracy of the theory in making predictions, and two, we can um, develop an experimental database so that we can make other predictions about new molecules and how they'll bond to the surface. So in this particular case, some of the stuff that Jean-Luc has found is that um, there are multiple contributions to how you can change the work function. Okay, And one is due to the interface dipole, which is literally the orientation of the dipole of the molecule at the interface. One is due to the um, essentially the electron transfer from the SAM to or from the interface that is a result of the bonding to the surface. And the third thing is that the dipole itself of the monolayer or the adsorbate, in the case of polymers, can change through its interaction with the surface. And we can also make predictions about how that's going to happen, in particular if you have Lewis acid, Lewis base properties um, on the donor and the acceptor. And so these have all been studied, and John Luke has studied, as an example, these molecules, um, which have all actually been studied by IRAS and NEXAFs, so that we have experimental data on their orientation relative to the substrate. And what you can see is that if you look at the change in work function as a function of the dipole moment orthogonal to the surface, okay, there's a relative linear, a relatively linear chain line for both the experimental and the calculated um, uh, changes in work function, which means that this is a predictable way to tune in the work function that you may need for a, a specific surface. Okay? The other thing that you can do, you can begin to do, is to deal with the fact that surfaces, while we like them to be perfect, um, are not. Okay, and so this is some work that's uh, published uh, by Hong, who is in the back here, um, and Jean Luc, where they be they begin to look specifically on what are the role of defects, and in particular here you have um, bridging hydroxides, oxygen vacancies, okay, uh, zinc vacancies on the structure and on the work function of surfaces. So. We're going away from idealized systems to the fact that in the real world, our systems are not nearly as ideal, and we need to be able to have some ability to take into account um, the non-ideality of our systems when we're trying to make predictions about how we want to uh, modify our surfaces. Um, this represents a collaboration between Georgia Tech and the University of Washington. And this, this is just a slide that shows that there are many different ways that one can deposit SAMs on surfaces. Our original studies involved doing various kind of dip coating techniques. More recently, in collaboration with Sam Graham's group, um, there has been a lot of work where they have shown that you can actually spray coat these things, these phosphonic acids, onto surfaces very quickly. 
okay, and efficiently, and then rinse off the excess. This is another example where rather than spray coating, uh, you're actually uh, inking a stamp, okay, here, and then you are micro contact printing the phosphonic acids on a surface. And this just shows results of uh, Kelvin uh, probe microscopy looking at the surface potential. And there are two things that I want to point out here. One is that, um, as you can see by this glitch, this almost looks like a cartoon in that, you know, it's, it's really nice circles, but you can see there's a little bit of schmutz here, uh, which tells us that this is actually a real sample. Okay, uh, the samples are flat. Okay, um, this is on ITO. And the circles are really very, very sharp. There are very sharp definitions between the surface uh, or between the circle uh, which has the phosphonic acid and the region which doesn't. And you can see that here, okay? And so what that's telling you is that there's very little bleed when we stamp these things. And that may be due to the fact that the phosphonic acids bind very uh, rapidly and rigorously to the surface. You may want to anneal them to get the highest degree of binding, um, but you don't get much spread. And what you're seeing here is that there is actually a change in the surface potential, okay? between where you have phosphonic acids and where you don't have phosphonic acids. And that's consistent with the change of work function that we see when we make macroscopic uh, surfaces covered with these phosphonic acids. So what um, Dave's group at University of Washington did was they made a very, very simple OLED structure out of spinning a polymer down on a surface patterned with these phosphonic acids, the pentafluorobenzophosphonic acid. And the idea was that what we would do is we would increase the work function where we had the phosphonic acids, thus getting better alignment between the Fermi level of the surface and the, the polymer so that we'd have improved charge injection. Okay, and the idea then was that where we have improved charge injection, we would probably see contrast in the degree of luminance that we see. Okay, so uh, here is a cartoon showing that process, and here are uh, photographs of something, and what you can see is that there are defects, and those defects are actually defects in the stamp not defects in the printing process. You can go back and look at your stamp and see where there are spots missing. But you can see that there is a relatively good contrast between where we have on and off, and that's shown here a little more quantitatively on this uh, log plot. And what you end up getting is about a thousand to one contrast ratio where you have the phosphonic acids and versus where you don't, which means that you can very um, easily control the uh, luminance just by printing down these patterns of phosphonic acids. And that's also manifested in the current density, okay? Um, the other thing that you can do with the phosphonic acids is look at them in combination with a polymer for solar cells. And you can ask, uh, what happens when you begin to um, move the um, work function of the uh, ITO into near resonance uh, with that of the material from which you're collecting holes um, from an energetic standpoint. And so what we have here are phosphonic acids which both uh, lower the work function and increase the work function. And so this is a relatively electron deficient polymer and so what we want to do is we want to push down the, the energy levels of the, of the uh, ITO by using phosphonic acids that will increase the work function, okay? And indeed, you can see this, okay, um, as measured by UPS and Kelvin Pro, okay? The question is, does that have any manifestation in terms of the properties of these materials? And indeed it does. If you raise the work function of the ITO, what you see is um, a relatively low power conversion efficiency and a relatively low VOC. But if you increase the work function, okay, what you see is that you get a relatively high VOC and a relatively high power conversion efficiency. And so the take home message here is that at least the, um, the phosphonic acids can be used to tune in whatever work function you might need for a specific uh, polymer, okay? 
Um, this is work that's been done in collaboration with Barra Tundakola, who I believe you'll see talking this afternoon. Uh, Barra is interested in thermal management, and he's also interested in thermoelectrics and uh, thermal galvanic cells. And uh, <clears throat> he's been exploring the use of carbon nanotubes to remove heat, okay, from chips. So what the idea then is, is that we essentially would have a chip that would have a copper surface and that that would be coated with a native oxide. And what his question was is the following. What he found is that when he presses the carbon nanotubes, against the surface and he models the thermal resistivity of the system. There is a resistance on, within the copper, there's a resistance within the carbon nanotubes, and there is a contact resistance. And the resistance within the carbon nanotubes is low, the resistance within the copper is low, and the resistance at the contact was high. So he asked us, can you provide us with a material that will lower the contact resistance? Okay. This is a great thing about working with engineers because sometimes if you know a little bit of chemistry, you can solve what may be challenging engineering problems with relatively trivial chemistry. And so what's well known to us, obviously, is that phosphonic acids bind to metal oxides. So we can do something that will bind to a metal oxide. And then the question is, can we do something that will increase the degree of contact between the carbon nanotubes and the surface to lower the resistance. And so it's also well known that pyrene molecules bind to carbon species such as carbon nanotubes and more recently to graphene. Okay, so it doesn't take a rocket scientist to think about combining those two things into one molecule where one end binds to the copper and the other end binds through non-covalent interactions to the graphene. Um, what was a little surprising to us is that if you just take these things without any particular pressure applied, okay, the contact resistance goes down by, the thermal contact resistance goes down by a factor of 8.8. .8. Now, if you press these things under high pressure, you can make that difference a little bit less, but you can see that just putting the, the carbon nanotubes in contact with the surface and putting them under pressure really leads to no change. The other thing that he noted is that the um, electrical resistance also goes down by a factor of eight. So this just shows an example of how we can use um, surface chemistry. It's not surface energy, but we're using specific interactions to improve the interaction between two disparate materials at a surface. And obviously there are any number of ways you can do that depending upon what the materials are. Um, I think John may talk a little bit about doping work. I will mention that another surface that has gotten some attention lately is graphene. Okay. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work on both um, N-dopins, which happen to be air stable, and we have some very, very strong N-dopins, okay, um, uh, which nonetheless are air stable solids that you can put in a bottle. And that's illustrated here with this uh, cyclopentadienyl um, CP star rhodium dimer that we have here. This material conceptually um, can be thought as being e equilibrium with this material here. This material here is an extremely hot and unstable material at ambient temperature. It's, it's what's called a 19 electron organometallic compound. It very much likes to give up electrons. It's, you can see the ionization potential is very, very low. So it's a strong reducing agent. But at ambient temperature, it dimerizes to this. And through a couple of different mechanisms, we can actually have this air stable material behave with surfaces as if it's reacting like that. And so I show you here the example of graphene where we can get work function changes. Actually here it's, um, it's less than a volt. We've seen work function changes as much as a volt where we decrease the work function of graphene. Okay, and then here is one of a class of metal oxidants with which we've been working. This is a solution processable uh, metal oxidant that's about one to two tenths of a volt more oxidizing than 4-FTCNQ, 
Okay, it can be used to solution dope a variety of things. And in this case, what we're doing is we're oxidizing graphene. And the most recent data suggests that we can actually raise the work function of graphene by uh, plus 0 0.7 volts. Okay, so with just using the surface treatment of graphene with things that are not chemically interacting with the graphene in any other way but to either inject an electron or um, remove an electron from the bands, okay, as in we're not destroying chemical bonds in the graphene, okay, we can modulate the work function over a range of 1.7 volts. Uh, this is work that was pioneered in Bernard Kiplan's group, which is an other kind of surface modification. And here, the surface modification is being done using ultra-thin films of uh, what is essentially a commodity polymer. Okay? Um, this is a hydroxylated polyethylene imine, and this is just polyethylene um, imine. imine. Okay? Both of these polymers are dirt cheap. They can be purchased, I think, basically on tanks. Uh, Kara's uh, scales. And <clears throat> what you can see here from the uh, UPS data is that there's large changes in the work function of these materials when you put down the polyethylene imine on the surface. And indeed what happens is that you can lower the work function of the surface um, through a combination of charge transfer to the surface induced dipole moments by rearranging the structure of the amine at the surface so that the Dipoles associated with the amine are preferentially all pointing in one direction, and then the effect of that surface dipole on the, um, the work function. Okay. So what does this enable you to do? It enables you to do a variety of things. Here is an example where you have a solar cell where you treat an ITO surface with polyethylene imine. Okay, such that you can preferentially collect electrons at that interface. Okay, then you take uh, this polymer, which was developed at University of Chicago, and a standard mixture, put molyoxide on the top, and what you can see is that you can end up getting a, a material using now ITO as the electron collecting electrode, which is not the way we typically do it, and it's obviously not a particularly error sensitive electrode. Um, with an efficiency of uh, around 6.5%. Another thing that this enables you to do is to take a surface that's plastic and then uh, take a um, what is nominally a whole injection material, treat that with the polyethylene imine. Okay, so now you've lowered the work function of that. And so now we're using a polymer as the electron collecting electrode. You can deposit um, a, a mixture of P3HT and ICBA on top of that, and then just put some P dot on top of that as a um, hole collecting electrode. And you can make an all plastic solar cell that can be bended. There's zero metal, and there's zero metal oxide in here. Okay. And what you can see is that this makes a, a quite respectable uh, solar cell, which is basically all carbon-based, except for the fact that there are some sulfurs and things like that in here. But, but there are so, certainly no metals. So that was work that was published last year. This is a relatively universal method for changing the work function of a variety of different electrodes. Here you see the P.PSS, where you can change it by nearly 1.5 volts. Graphene, you can change it by... Um, nearly a volt, okay, and you can see you can change zinc oxide, ITO, FTO, um, pretty much everything that you put this on, okay. So we see this as a, um, a very valuable way of changing the work function. We still think that there are things that we can do scientifically to understand all the factors that lead to that, and that's work that's ongoing within the center. Okay, so I have one more part, but I'll just say that the phosphonic acids allow us to modify these things. We're still working on optimizing the deposition and, and, and washing efficiency. Uh, unlike polymers, they don't planarize surfaces, and so there may be some advantages to polymers for certain things. The amine materials, okay, 
um, seem to act as a universal method to lower the work function. We can get improved charge injection and collection. We can get air stable cathodes, okay, and where we don't need to use reactive metals. Um, we still have detailed mechanistic aspects. The last thing I want to tell you about is some work that's a collaboration between several groups, in particular Elisa Rieto in physics, Jennifer Curtis in physics, and our group. This work builds off work that was done many years ago at IBM where they used cantilevers um, for AFM where you can uh, essentially dope the cantilever in such a way that you can make a circuit and where the arms of the cantilever are highly conducting, but the tip is highly resistive. And therefore, therefore by uh, passing current through it, what you can end up doing is um, heating up the cantilever. So we have shown some time ago that you can make polymers where you have a cross-link polymer and a protecting group on an amine, and just by heating this, you can blow that off. And in that manner, what you can do is write chemical functionality at the surface, which can be then further reacted for a variety of different applications. This can also be done with conjugated materials, where now we have a precursor to a conjugated material, which turns into that conjugated material very easily. Uh, this is an example where you can take graphene oxide and heat it with the AFM tip, and get down to graphene uh, or reduce graphene. And so what that allows you to do is to modulate the electrical properties of these materials. Finally, what you can do here, because you can control temperature very accurately, is you can write thermal gradients, uh, or rather chemical gradients at the surface by controlling the reaction temperature. And this just shows can examples where we have the amine polymer pattern at the surface and then labeled with a fluorescent dye. And what you can see is that you can, in the curve, predict the amount of deprotection as evidenced by the intensity of light, okay? And then you can go and measure it and you can, you can predict it and measure it and, and reproduce that very well. So what that allows you to do is to write patterns of chemical gradients and that's illustrated here by taking a uh, picture that has a variety of grayscale, okay, going from dark to gray to very white, okay, and we're converting that into no reaction, some reaction, strong reaction, and then you can reproduce that on a nanometer scale with many levels of grayscale. And so what you have here is an image of this which functionally has encoded in it chemical information in terms of gradients of materials, which can be done trivially using this technique. So with that, I see the boss here. I'm done. And so, um, and it's basically 25 minutes. So if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them.